Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the sparsely populated tiny town of Johnson's Crossing, the Yukon Territory in Canada. Dense stands of fir and spruce interrupt muskeg and tundra-covered ground, as this area is a buffer zone as the land transitions into all tundra just north of ways. I guess I would call this area taiga, as the trees are smaller than in forests, but there are many of them. The Teslin River winds its way through the valley and delivers its seasonal supply of chum salmon to people and bears alike. Common animals here include woodland and barren ground caribou, moose, elk, mule deer, and you might even see a musk ox or two if you hold your jaw just right. Squirrels, marmots, and lemmings are not a rare sight, and they are pursued by a gaggle of small predators like red, gray, and arctic foxes, coyotes, lynx, and several members of the weasel family. The large predators here include cougars, gray wolves, all three species of bear, black, brown, and polar bears. It is in this lively and wild environment that our episode takes place today. On the morning of October 18, 2014, Matthias Leninger and his wife, 42-year-old Claudia Huber, were enjoying time at their cabin just outside of Johnson Crossing. They were both transplants from Switzerland and had made the Yukon area their home about eight years prior. The common saying is that if you're a woman looking for a man in Alaska, the odds are good. The only problem is the goods are odd, best describes the local folk here. But Matthias and Claudia found a way to fit right in. They were so entwined into the local social fabric that they both landed jobs with the Teslin Tlingit First Nations, a group of indigenous people with ancestry dating back thousands of years from this area. They also ran a business, offering guided wilderness trips and accommodations to Europeans primarily, and had developed a strong clientele from German speakers abroad. They called their guide service the Breath of Wilderness. Matthias and Claudia wanted to stay in the Yukon for the rest of their lives. They had no children, but were bonded to each other as close as anyone. Their roots ran so deep in this country that they'd both received permanent citizenship and officially became Canadian citizens together. Claudia was the kind of woman who was undaunted by the rigorous demands of frontier life, and was known as a woman who could handle a chainsaw and then go home and dress up for a night on the town. Matthias described his wife as the most stunning woman you've ever seen. It was clearly a taiga love story that knew no limitations. Claudia and the couple's Alaska Malamute named Kona were outside the cabin, Kona began barking at something in the trees nearby, and Claudia heard something moving in the brush. Claudia looked over to see a 375-pound brown bear emerging from the tree line and crossing the lawn of the cabin. She immediately hustled herself and Kona inside to safety. Whether it was curiosity or predatory behavior initially is hard to tell, but the undersized male immediately approached the front window of the cabin and placed his massive paws on the glass separating him and Claudia. At this time of year, a healthy brown bear would be much larger than 375 pounds. In my mind, there is no doubt this bear had not dominated the salmon stream fishing spots and was in a bad way. It should have been at least 300 pounds heavier this time of year, and this is an aggravating circumstance to the following events. Just as the bear set its massive paws on the front window, it leaned in a bit, and the glass gave way with a thunderous shatter. The big bear tumbled inside and quickly scrambled back to its feet. It immediately began to run after Kona. Claudia and Matthias quickly fled outside, each to a different one of the two cars parked out front. In the confusion, Kona fled to the nearby trees. Claudia jumped into the couple's SUV and watched as Matthias scrambled into the other car just a few yards away. They were so surprised by this home invasion that neither one of them managed to grab the keys to either vehicle. For the time being, they were safe inside their vehicles, but the bear wasn't finished yet. As soon as the bear's eyes met Matthias's, it leapt onto the hood of the vehicle, sheltering him. It slid off, so it jumped up on it again, denting and scratching the hood horribly. Matthias began using the only weapon he had, the horn of his car. He began honking and honking at the bear, trying to scare it away. The noise of the car horn did frighten the bear off, but only a short distance. As soon as the bear was several yards from the vehicle Matthias was in, Claudia decided to quickly run to her husband, and they would be together. She scrambled from the SUV and sprinted toward Matthias in the other car. 
The only problem with this idea is that brown bears, especially desperate ones, are extremely quick. The big bear was quickly on top of Claudia, only a few yards from the SUV she had left. It had pinned her down and was biting and clawing at her back, tearing her flesh, and clearly trying to kill her. She stared up at her husband with her eyes wide, pleading for his intervention. Matthias yelled at her to lay down and play dead. In a desperate attempt to stop the attack, she decided to take his advice. She played dead and forced her body to go limp. This trick seemed to work as the bear stopped biting and clawing her and began dragging her toward the trees. This gave Matthias an opportunity he didn't have before leaving the house. They had a firearm inside, and he sprinted inside to get it. He quickly returned with a gun and fired several shots at the bear as it stood over his wife. He ran out of bullets, so it was necessary to go back inside and grab more ammo. He quickly returned to his wife and the bear and fired several more shots at the bear. Some of these shots hit the bear in a vital area, and soon it lay still on the ground, dead. Matthias quickly ran over to his wife's side. She had several bad injuries, but seemed to be in worse shape than her injuries showed. She was bitten and clawed up badly, but was losing consciousness. Claudia was rushed to the Teslin Community Medical Center. An initial inspection of her clothes showed no gunshot damage. It seemed the only injuries to her body were caused by the bear attack. Claudia managed to hang on for a while, but shortly after noon, she passed away. Claudia's body was picked up by the Yukon Chief Coroner's Office for analysis. They reported that examination of her body was difficult due to the significant amount of tissue damage done during the bear attack. As they examined her body and gauged the damage the bear had done, they found that the injury that claimed her life was a bullet fired by her husband. The investigators examined the evidence at the cabin and found that there was a tree branch that had been shot, with bullet fragments still embedded in the branch. The branch was in a straight line path to where Claudia's body was lying. She had clearly been shot from a bullet, which deflected from the tree branch and struck her in the chest. While they were looking at the cabin location, the investigators tried to see what brought the bear to Matthias and Claudia's property. There were no garbage cans left out, nor food around, to draw this bear to this location. The investigators described their cabin as properly bear-proofed and well-kept. The locals had described a rather glaring environmental stressor this year. The low-bush cranberries had been essentially non-existent this year. Claudia and her friends even noted this as they picked them each season. A necropsy was performed on the bear, and it was found to be in poor condition, though it was not said to be starving, as it still had fat reserves. Unbelievably, this bear was reported to be 38 years old, which was stated by two different sources. I initially thought that had to be a typo, as sources frequently conflict when I do research, but not this time. This was a very old male brown bear. The bear had no underlying disease that was identified in the necropsy. It had, however, broken into a nearby hunting cabin about three weeks prior to this attack and ransacked it, devouring anything it could find. This means that it had learned to recognize human structures as a food source. The chief coroner, Kristen McDonald, said that Matthias did the right thing, and really the only thing he could do. She stated that the predatory attack was not going to stop unless this bear was dead. Matthias had no other option. Matthias stated that he doesn't feel responsible for his wife's death, despite firing that shot that killed her, according to the coroner's office. He has a hard time getting over what he saw and heard on that fateful day. He continued to say that he is not mad at the bear. He says they knew where they lived. The beauty of the wilderness still has its dangers. He finishes by saying that Claudia will always be with him, that she is everywhere, in the northern lights, and the ravens. He sees it as he has two choices, to go into the woods and let the wolves kill him, or move on. He says Claudia would kick his butt and say, you better move on. Now by himself, Matthias organized a memorial service for his Claudia, for relatives from Switzerland. He can't go back to their home, and is reportedly a shell of the man he was when he was with her. Wow, that was a real tearjerker, folks. After reviewing the facts around this attack, I have a few questions for you. Do you think if Matthias had used bear spray that Claudia may still be alive? Do you think he fired at the bear from too far away? What do you think Matthias could have done differently? Is this the natural path of aging bears just trying to find a way to survive? I'll be happy to read and reply to your comments, so post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it.